Good morning, everybody, and welcome to St Mary's Church in Sutton Valence for today, the second Sunday of Epiphany. Now, you may remember from last week when we thought about the wise men visiting the baby Jesus in the manger, that these next few weeks make up a whole season in the church's year that is known as Epiphany. It's not just for last week, it's for last week, this week and the next three weeks. And each week we are meant to learn something more about the nature of Christ. Because epiphany actually comes from the Greek word for manifestation or to reveal oneself. So each week over the next, each Sunday over the next few weeks, we will be looking at another aspect that Christ reveals to himself, to those around him, and to the nations. Now, you may think it's a bit odd that today, the second Sunday, we're thinking about his baptism, not as a baby, but as an adult, aged 30 years. We've suddenly wound the clock forward 30 years. Does that mean that there's nothing important that we can learn from his life as a child or a young adult? Well, no, of course there isn't. It, does, it doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that this is the next most important time. This is the next most important thing that he revealed to the nations about his character and who he was. And it's something that we should all hold in our hearts with great joy, just as we're meant to always hold in our hearts the vision of the Christ child being visited by the Magi. So, today's service is a morning worship. There's no communion, uh, so you don't need to uh, sort yourselves out for that. Just engage. So God in Christ has revealed his glory. Come, let us worship. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The Lord's name is greatly to be praised. Give him praise, you servants of the Lord. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Well, we are meant to praise the name of the Lord and we are also meant to think about all the many gracious gifts that he has given to us. In particular, we're meant to think about that wonderful gift that he gave us in his son and the fact that his son not only took on human nature, not only took on our immortality, but also took on our sins as well. And as we all know, even though he'd done nothing wrong himself, he was willing to die for us. Now, how does that make you feel? I hope it makes you feel just a little bit guilty. And I hope it gives you the desire to work a little bit harder, to lead better, um, better lives. So now is our opportunity to say sorry for the times when we have behaved in ways that have let ourselves down and let God down, and to ask him to help us in the future. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. So let us confess our sins. God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. 
Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. And the God of all healing and forgiveness draw you to himself and cleanse you from all your sins that we may behold the glory of your Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We will now have our Bible reading. Well, our reading this morning is from the Gospel according to St Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse, 11, uh, verse 4, and it is the baptism of Christ. And so, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stand down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love with you. I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will use the words of my lips to breathe your perfect message into the hearts and minds of all those who hear me, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you are sitting at home thinking to yourselves, haven't we had that reading before quite recently? Well, if you are, You'd be dead right, because it's only just a few weeks ago that we had it for our reading for the second Sunday of Advent. So it's about a month ago. And, but then we were looking at it um, from the point of view of John the Baptist. Here's the person we were focusing on. Today, however, we are in the season of Epiphany. It is the time when we are meant to be looking to see how Christ revealed himself to all people as being the Son of God and everything that goes with it. So today, we're meant to almost ignore John the Baptist and focus on Christ. Now, the first thing to say about this reading is the fact that it did take place when Christ was 30 years old, but it forms a watershed moment in every sense of the word in his life because this was the moment that he stepped out of his life as a humble carpenter living a relatively safe comfortable and secure life surrounded by loved ones and he stepped out of that into a life where he knew that he was going to be met with opposition, with fear, with antagonism, and ultimately with people reacting in such a way that he would die. This moment really shows the courage that Christ had. Now, if you will remember from when we looked at this reading in Advent, John the Baptist preached 
a bapti- a, a, preached a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. He asked everyone to pre- prepare themselves to receive the King, the Messiah, Christ. And he said the way to do that was to release yourself from all your sins. This baptism was a way of cleansing people from that. And Christ now comes along and he asks for this baptism, even though he has done absolutely nothing wrong. And of course, in so doing, he not only marks the beginning of a new relationship with God and God's people, just like anybody does in a baptism, but he also showed that even though he had done nothing wrong in his life and didn't need any forgiveness, he was actually accepting the fact that he was fully human and he was putting himself alongside all of human, fully human and flawed humanity and counting himself amongst us. This event more than ever shows Christ's humanity but it also shows us quite a few other things. I'm going to show you a picture. Don't you think it's a wonderful picture? There's a lot going on here. What I'm actually showing you is only about a third of the picture because, as with many that were done at this time, it actually has a part of a journey and you will see different parts of what John the Baptist does and various other people. So this is just the bit that matters for today, the bit with Christ being baptised. And um, as you will see, it's um, really, really beautiful. The actual original sits or hangs in the Sistine Chapel, so it's got to be good, hasn't it? So what have we got? Well, as you will see, At the very, very centre of the painting, we have Jesus standing in the River Jordan with John baptising him. It's amazing, isn't it? That even though there is a lot of busyness all around, people gathered all along the banks, some of them chatting to each other, some of them watching, some of them doing various other things, people preparing for their own baptisms, some people who um, we can see one man who's just been baptised and he's drying himself off and about to get dressed. Lots is going on, but right at the centre, there is that element of utter peace and stillness as Christ stands there and allows John the Baptist to pour the water over him. Surely that says something about the peace that Christ brings to any situation or can do. There's also something else I don't know whether you've noticed. Normally, when we have a baptism these days, um, more often than not, They are quite private family occasions, definitely not public spectacles. This was very different. Look at all the people, all gathered from all over the place, all part of it. Christ's baptism was a very, very public occasion. And you can see people looking at him. They're watching as it happens, as Christ stands there almost naked, submitting to this baptism, saying he is a sinner, even though he's not. Surely this tells us a lot about the humbleness of Christ. Also, I don't know whether you've noticed from all the people gathered around, the vast majority of them are in groups. They may be friends, they may be family units, I don't know. Very, very few, if any of them, are on their own, apart from Christ himself. He stands on his own and he stands out. And actually he would have done, because he came from Nazareth in the north. Everybody else came from the south. He was different and he stood out as being different and he stood out as being alone. 
And yet that didn't put him off. Doesn't that show his courage? Another thing that I notice is the fact that you look at the picture very carefully and you will see that John the Baptist has a halo. Christ doesn't, does he? Why does Christ not have a halo when John the Baptist does? Again, is this just cementing the view that Christ is fully human? Of course, because instead of having a halo, he does have something else, something very, very special. And that is the dove, the Holy Spirit, hovering just above him, indicating the fact that God isn't just cleansing him from the sins that he hasn't committed, but helping him to help all of humanity to deal with their sins. He's not just doing that, but he's empowering him with the Holy Spirit for what is going to happen next. And he would have felt that. Of course, a picture cannot um, speak to us as well. So the picture cannot actually tell us about the words that God spoke. You are my son, whom I love. I am very pleased with you, or I am well pleased. He obviously came from Essex. Sorry. I am well pleased with you. They were important words for Christ to hear. Those words plus the Spirit show us that Christ truly is part of the Holy Trinity. It tells, they tell us a lot about Christ, but also about God as a whole, a Trinitarian God, who are always there for each other, helping, supporting, enabling and loving each other. You've heard me say that numerous times before. So this tells us about Christ and his need for empowerment by the Spirit and approval by God and the fact that he got it. And it also tells us about the Holy Trinity, about the fact they work together. And this final part of the picture that describes that would have been crucially important as Christ started out his ministry and journeyed his way to the cross. They would have been words that would have echoed in his heart and his mind throughout all that time. And as he approached the difficult moments in his ministry, they would have been the words that would have truly helped him and supported him. So in short... What do we learn from Christ about, from his baptism? Obviously his humanity, obviously his divinity and the part, fact that he is part of the Holy Trinity. There is his humbleness, his courage, his obedience and his willingness to step out alone. I wonder... Can we emulate any of those wonderful things? And can we be as obedient as, as he was and as willing to sacrifice ourselves for the, for the cause of the building of God's kingdom and the helping of our fellow humans? I hope so. Well, as Christ stepped out in faith, from one aspect of his life, one chapter in his life into a completely new one, I know that there was one thing he really, really needed. And we also know that he received it, the Spirit of God. Now, God promises us his Spirit, his life-giving, affirming and enabling spirit as we step out into the new every different stage of our life as we step out into each new day so let us remember that with our next hymn holy spirit living breath
of God. Living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in What I cannot see Give me passion for your purity Holy Spirit, bring new life in me Of course, Jesus knew exactly who he was. John the Baptist knew exactly who he was. He recognised him as the Son of God, the Messiah. And at that event, at at Christ's baptism, John would have also been very much aware of the Holy Spirit and the Father all working together. He knew who they were. He believed in them. I wonder, can we honestly say that we believe? I hope so, as we join together in saying the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. And our collect or special prayer for today. Heavenly Father, at the Jordan you revealed Jesus as your Son. May we recognise him as Lord and know ourselves to be your beloved children through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Amen. I'll now ask Gova to lead us in our prayers. O Christ, you humbled yourself and received baptism at the hands of your friend and cousin, John, showing us the way of humility. Help us to follow you and never to be encumbered with pride. O Christ, by your baptism, you took our humanity into the cleansing waters. Give us new birth and lead us into life as sons and daughters of God. O Christ, by your baptism, the material world became charged with your holiness. Make us instruments of your transformation in this our world. O Christ, by your baptism, you revealed the Trinity, your Father calling you his beloved Son, and the Spirit descending upon you like a dove. Renew our worship, rededicate us in the spirit of your baptism, and mould us into our true nature in the image of God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. O Lord, our Father, we pray for those who are guiding our nation and the nations of the world at this difficult time. Direct their counsels and guide their decisions that they and we may be led into the ways of health, justice, freedom and peace. We continue to pray for peace throughout the world, Lord, in all places where there is war, unrest and disharmony. We pray that you will look mercifully on the sufferings of all your people, on refugees from war and famine, those without food, without water, without homes, and without hope. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. O Lord, our Father, we pray that you will strengthen, comfort, and support all who are affected by the coronavirus through illness, bereavement, isolation, or anxiety. Be with the vulnerable and the fearful, the gravely ill and the dying, Lord, that they may know your comfort and peace. Keep safe, doctors, nurses, and all who work in hospitals, care homes, hospices, and in the homes of patients. Guide and strengthen the work of all those who seek a cure and a vaccine for the virus, that many may be restored to health. We pray, Lord, that you will keep safe the doctors and nurses who care for us in our own communities through our doctors' practices. We pray also for our schools and universities, <clears throat> their teaching staff and their pupils and students as they struggle to cope with new practices and procedures in learning and in acquiring qualifications. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Remember in mercy, Lord, all who are passing through illness of body, mind or spirit, and especially those of whom we are now thinking of our prayers. <clears throat> we pray especially for Hazel Pope, Joan Lowry, Stephanie Pereira, Elizabeth Ashby, Tessa Webb, John Worsfold, Diana Beeman, Bob and Anne Chance, Colin Finden, and Tony Old. We remember, Lord, those who have died in the faith of Christ, 
Especially we pray for Jenny Bartom, Paul Davis, Jean Bird, Graham Edmed, Myra Waring, Tony Kettle, Richard Smith, and Michael Moore. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Finally, O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life until the shades lengthen, the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so let us bring all our prayers together in the words that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. Next week, our service will be from probably St. Peter and St. Paul's East Sutton. And David Trustrum will be um, speaking to us. So I look forward to that. Uh, I hope you'll join me. In the meantime, the only real notice I've got is for anybody who lives in Headcorn and the Suttons who might have put a star on our Tree of Remembrance. They have now been all laid out on the shelf at the back of church. So please do feel free to come and get them if you would like to. Um, please don't fiddle with anybody else's. And um, any that are left over come Easter will be burnt um, for the first fire, for the, for the fire, for the first light on uh, Easter Eve. So it's quite a special and emotional thing that we do with them. So our final, our closing prayer and final blessing. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love to serve your purpose and to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three persons in one God, inspire you to live as one, that you may witness to the perfect unity of his love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and all those who you love and care for now and always. Amen. Amen.